Good afternoon and welcome to the joint CAD 1 BD Mackey Consulting webinar today, Revit Tips for Structural Tools and Processes. I'm Stan Henney, I'm the Business Development Manager here at CAD 1 and I have as my co-presenter today Brian Mackey, founder of BD Mackey Consulting and a uh, getting to be a pretty darn well-known Revit consultant all around the, the country and we're Brian's been a family member here for a long time, so we're real pleased to see the success he's having with that. Some housekeeping here real quick. Uh, if you're listening and you can hear us, you might, if you want to raise your hand, you can hit the little hand button there and we can see who can hear us. Otherwise, uh, assume everybody can hear us pretty well. Uh, if you want to move the console over, get it out of the way so you can see the full screen, hit the orange arrow. Most of you know how to do a GoToMeeting by now. So, and by all means, the biggest one is the Ask Questions. Absolutely. So if I'm presenting something and you guys have a question right there on the fly, ask that question so we can get it answered while it's still in context. Because otherwise, yeah. it's sometimes hard to go back and, wait, what were we showing 20 minutes ago? That's when we got into this? right. And we will be recording this today. Brian's going to do a quick, quick poll here. We will be recording this today. And... Our good friend uh, Denny will have it posted on our YouTube channel if we're successful recording it, <laughs> which we usually are anymore, uh, in the next few days. So um, you can look for it there as well if you want to watch it again. So just checking to see if we have all structural engineers, contractors, architects, MEP, kind of seeing what, what's going on here so we know how we're going to be presenting this because the, the tips that we're going to be showing are going to be, some of them are just going to be flat out Revit tips. Some of them are going to be specific to the structural tools. Now, it's not going to be too many tips by the analytical side of things unless there's time, but most of it is going to be, you know, tips for the structural tools that we use. So it looks like we're um, doing okay, so we'll close and share that poll with everybody. So it looks like we expected mostly structural engineers here, but we do have an equal amount of architects and an equal amount of other. So congratulations to the others and the architects. You tied. <laughs> Given the number we have, that's uh, not what we expected. So with that said, we're going to jump right in. So as those of you all who know me, I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of PowerPoint. I did a PowerPoint on this one just mostly because that way I can remember what the heck I wanted to be um, talking about as we get in, into the file. So I'm just going to jump right into Revit and start getting into some of that information. So one of the things that I always like to talk about, and the first one I have on the PowerPoint slide is transfer project standards. And I think a lot of people don't know that this is a really beneficial tool when you've got the architect's file linked in, or even if you're an architect and you've got the structural engineers or MEP, et cetera. So, oh, great. Waiting on this nice issue I have in 2014 for my application menu to open. But I'm going to go ahead and open up um, the structural version of my building that everybody probably knows and loves. But one thing I want to show is, so if I'm the structural engineer, uh, We'll just say, okay. So if I'm the structural engineer working on this file and I got the architect and now I'm going to go start printing my sheets, I may know that the architect has all the project information filled out. The, the location, the address, possibly, you know, we're getting into CDs and the revisions are being filled out. So one of the tools that I find very beneficial, and I showed this to a client the other day and they were like, wow, this worked really well, is that when we go to our transfer project standards, we can transfer project standards from files that are linked into our file. So if we've linked in the architect's file, we've linked in the MEP file, we can transfer project standards from any one of those files. So a lot of times I start telling um, engineers as they get started is, you know, the architects spelled that, that name out. They fill out the project name, the project address. Yeah, they've probably put their own project number in there, but that's easy enough to go change. But more importantly, they might also have a lot of parameters that they're using for their title blocks for you to schedule. So if they've got custom parameters, they're going to be loaded into their project as project information, which is what we're going to transfer to get the name, the date, all of that, that sort of things in here anyway. So I'm just going to come down here and go say, you know, the only thing I really wanted to transfer was my project information. And actually, before I do that, let's just come up here and actually go to the project information so you can kind of see, you know, my project information has some things in here, issue date, owner, status, name, number, it's so really nothing inside of here that's really going to be in my project information. So what I'm going to do is go transfer, manage, transfer project standards, choose the linked architects file, and say, you know, the only thing I'm really going to look for at this point in time is project information. 
Well, like I was saying, um, inside of there, you could go in and grab the um, revisions. So if you get down to CA phase, you can transfer the revisions from the architect, etc. So I'm going to grab my project information. You might want to grab project parameters. I don't usually recommend this because if the architect has like 600 custom project parameters, you're getting all of those. But if you say transfer project information and there are custom parameters in there, it will bring in the custom parameters as well. And it's saying, hey, there is some location information. Hey, overwrite what I have and give me what the architect had. So we'll go back and say project information. That's not project information. Wrong button. So project um, information. Now you can see inside of here, it filled out the client name, it filled out the project name, the project number, and it did kind of do some of that information for me. So think of that transfer project standards for maybe the building information, you know, the project information. You also get the project um, location if they've located it on the map, etc. So one of those nice little features that I don't think everybody knows is there when they start to get inside of the file. So the other tip that I have that's kind of along the same path is a lot of times I'll get the structural engineers, mechanical engineers, and they're like, okay, Mr. Architect, can you send me your title block? And then they send you their standard title block, and, but yet the title block that you're using on this project has been customized from the architect. So there's a couple of different ways about getting that title block from the architect, and the easiest way in my mind is open up their file, scroll down to their families, find their um, title block family, it should be under annotation symbols, and just right click and save it. So you can open up a model that's been given to you and save any family inside of there out to your server. So I can grab the title block from my architect, save this to my project specific folder, and then load that into my project. And I don't even have to ask them to email me their title block and wait for a response. I can just get the actual title block they're using in their project right in here and now once they give me the model. So that's kind of one of the big ones I always talk to people about too is go through and, you know, save families that you may need, especially the title block, into your server so therefore you have it for future use. I wait sit, you know, you're not going to have to go back and ask that the architect had one. The architect sent them the same title block nine times and it wasn't the right one. So that's where the structural engineer came back and said, okay, fine, we'll just go copy it from your project. Okay, so that's kind of a big one to me. That's real at the beginning what we're going in and starting to get in with. So next thing I want to talk about, and I actually gave a little bit of a present presentation on this at the Revit Technology Conference, and ironically somebody else was giving a presentation at the same time. But the next one I want to talk about is you'll see me actually use what I call a reference beam a lot. So I've got a family, and I'm just going to go ahead and insert my family here. I've got this family where I call it a reference beam. And basically what's happening inside of there is there isn't any 3D geometry in that beam. So I'll actually um, go place this beam real quick. But it's just a beam that has one symbolic line inside of it. But the reason I'm using this beam is when I'm doing beam systems where there might be a roof and I need to, you know, understand what's going on with the roof, get my beam system associated to that roof, but I don't want to have to just model all the individual beams or just do sketch lines for the beam system. So where I'm going to really use this, and I'm going to exactly that, I'm going to go in and model a roof. Right? It's not going to be a fancy roof. You guys are probably going to have much fancier roofs when you get into them. I'm just going to define the slope and, okay, great. So here's my roof when we start looking at this. All right, so if I go into my 3D view and go to my visibility graphics, because roofs are turned off in the default template. So if I come in here, you can see there's a roof here. And I'm going to go do a beam system on this roof. It might be representing rafters or whatever you're going to need to do inside of here. But I know I'm not going to really have a, a beam right on the edge of this roof. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I'll have a ridge beam. I'll have the tail beams, et cetera, but I might not have a beam right on the edges of that roof. So what I go through is I use what I do call my reference beam. So that way when I'm setting this up, I can get all these beams to join to the reference beam without having to go in and modify each one. So we'll go to level two, and I'll give you two examples of this. So I'm going to go ahead and model my normal beams, and I'm just going to use, sure, we'll use the 12 by 26. So let's say you're going in and you're modeling something using the 12 by 26s, but the thing that the architect's giving you to model or whatever it may be, it's just this curved rig, this curved canopy. And maybe that curved canopy wants the beams to go out, but it doesn't have an actual beam there. So I'm going to do a beam system. And sure, I could sketch the beam system, but in my mind, here's the easy way to do this. Grabbing my little reference beam family, I'm going to switch to an arc. It's not going to be that fancy of an object here. So here's my nice little arc. And I've got this reference beam to have a line type that's like some crazy dashed line type where it's got like a 20-foot space between the, the, the two lines. So in course mode, it only shows up on the edges. 
And if I switch to medium or fine, then it just disappears. And I can also turn it off into coarse mode too, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So once I've got that done, you know, now I can just go in and do a beam system. And I can choose the beam system to be my 8x10s. And now I don't have to go sketch the beam system. I can just simply pick the bay of my beam system to get that to do what I wanted it to do. So now over here you can see, oh gee, look at that. I've got this nice beam system coming in here. So a couple nuances of doing this. One, it does see that as an analytical beam, even though there's no analytical side to it. So if I tab to get to just that beam. So I do have an analytical beam inside of here. So what I can do is choose the actual structural framing member and just uncheck the enable analytical model. So that way if I am sending it out to an analytical program, I'm not going to get this reference beam, which not showing anything in the model, just the analytical curve lines. So that's one that I like to do. And then the other thing I did say is if you go in here and look in course mode, you will see that analytical beam because it's got some sort of crazy line to that. So what I've done in that beam family is I created an object style. So if I go to my Manage tab and I go to my Object Styles, under my Structural Framing, you're going to see that I have Structural Framing. You're going to see that I have a subcategory in here called Reference Only. And I made a line pattern. My line pattern, I call it empty. And basically, it's got, like I said, it's got a, it's got a start point and then a 50-foot dot or 50-foot space in there, excuse me. So I got an empty line type. And it's, it is its own subcategory. So the reason I've done that is, A, I can assign its own line type to it. But more importantly, if I don't want to see that in a view, I can again go down to the structural framing. I need to turn off some of these categories in here. I can go to my structural framing and just uncheck reference beam or reference only inside of here to just get back to my normal view. So even if I'm looking at a course level of detail, I can kind of hide that beam out of there. And I've seen a lot of people basically doing the same thing with, hey, I'm going to go create maybe uh, undulating roof deck, and I can assign beams to the undulating roof deck, but I don't actually print that roof deck. I put it on a work set or create a filter or a type of, of roof, et cetera, to be able to get rid of that. So reference beams, reference um, roofs, things like that works really, really well for that scenario. So it's one that a lot of my structural engineers have been starting to adopt, and they're really liking that reference beam scenario. So same thing would kind of be over here. I draw that reference beam on the ridge over here. So if I was to come in here and start modeling on this, you know, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to go look at a section real quick. So we'll go to level two. And I'm going to go change my view range real quick. Let's get this off of one foot. We'll go up like 40 feet. It'll make the top unlimited. Okay, so I'm coming inside of here. So, you know, it can even work if you are setting work planes. So if I come into this inside of here and I want to set the work plane by picking a plane I can pick my roof to be the work plane so right now I'm just going to pick this side of my roof and again now when I want to go model my beams I might actually have a ridge beam All right so I'm going to come up here at the end point of this and model my ridge beam I may or may not have a tail beam of course I probably should have loaded wood families for this but I may or may not have a tail beam we're just going to assume that there might be a you know a nice little um, beam down here that the tails and then I'll switch to my reference beam for the two sides. So I'll put my reference beam in here and another one over here. All right, so now the nice part about all of this, I'm just going to hide the roof of my sunglasses, is now I can go do a beam system. And it's going to yell at me saying, hey, you can't do a beam system because your work plane's still set to the um, curve there. Okay, so I'm going to um, cancel out of the beam system and go set my work plane back to be the level two. I always forget to do that one. So now I'm going to go do a beam system. And when I go to do this beam system, you'll see that as long as I have my 3D checked, I can come in here and just do the sketch beam system. So we're using 8 by 10s All right, boom, it looks like there's a beam there. But again, if I go to a medium level or a fine level of detail, that beam has now been turned off. So it works, makes it really nice to start going through and updating and setting this up. And the real reason why I like this is when the architect comes back and adds 10 feet to the roof, changes 10 feet to the roof, subtracts it, does whatever, I don't have to go through and constantly, um, of course level, I don't have to go through and keep editing the beam system. All I have to do is just take this line and stretch it. Now my beam system is moving with it, as well as the other two beams, the ridge and the tail beam. So that to me is kind of a really key object when you start getting inside of there, using those reference beams. I use them a lot when I get inside of there. So another nice little tip that we that I, I like to show, and since we're on the sloping beam here, I'm going to go ahead and model another beam, but I'm going to model parallel to this. And I'm going to go choose my work plane. 
oh, it won't let me do that since I've already had that. So let me go reset this. And let me go set the work plane. Pick a plane to the roof again. And I'm going to go ahead and model a beam this direction. And I'm going to cut a section through there. So one thing that I see a lot of people doing when they come inside of here and get into a medium level of detail, and I should probably actually switch that from a reference beam over here. <laughs> Oops. There we go. So when I get inside of here and start looking at this beam, so I made this roof my work plane. I guess I should have made the underneath side of my roof my work plane, but you guys get the gist. So a lot of people are like, that's great, but in this case, I needed that beam to be vertical. And most of the time I see people coming in here trying to figure out what that angle is, putting a cross-section rotation in to get that beam to be vertical. Well, there's actually an easier way. Instead of changing the cross-section rotation, there's this value in here called orientation, and you can change it from normal to horizontal. I don't know why they call it horizontal. It should actually be plumb. But if I have it horizontal, it goes plumb, or I can go back and change normal, and it goes perpendicular to the work plane. So that's um, a nice little tip that actually I was taught only about a year and a half, two years ago, that you've got this nice little normal slash horizontal, I keep calling it the plumb tool, if you're in a beam associated to that work plane. So same thing on this one. If I came in and grabbed this one, I can go say horizontal, so now it's more like a ridge beam as opposed to perpendicular to that work surface. So it works really nice. Nice little tool to have and just to know you've got that in your, your can of worms to be working inside of there. So, again, I don't have any questions yet, which is great. That must mean I'm actually doing something right. But if you do have questions come up, feel free to type them in. Or even comments on other ways you use the tool are always welcome to my presentations as well. So the next one I want to talk about are beams attached to the ends of a column. I forget what release it was. I think it was... Um, 12, but this feature came out, and I was dumbfounded when I found it because Autodesk did not have any documentation on this um, feature for this in 12. I just stumbled across this new property going, wow, what's going on? And thank you, Adam actually made a comment of he didn't know that the normal and the horizontal property was in there. Yeah, I felt the same way, Adam, when Desi showed that to me, so you're not alone in that, that feelings. So I'm going to come in here and draw a couple structural columns. I'm going to put a structural column here, and I'm going to put a structural column here. Oh, we'll put a couple more in. We'll just make this nice little big grid system thing in here. So there we go. So I'll put these columns in, and I'm going to go ahead and start modeling some beams. And I think I still have a sloping work plane, so I'm going to cancel and set my work plane back to level 2 before I do the beam. So all right, I've got some beams inside of here. And the one thing that always frustrated me in Revit structure is anybody who would ever use AutoCAD architecture, ooh, my beams are going the wrong direction. And, of course, I'm using the reference beams again. So let me grab those reference beams. So one thing on that, too, by the way, is to grab a chain of beams, you can use the tab key. So just like you can with walls, rather than grabbing one beam and control to grab the next beam, if you grab, hit the tab key, you can actually grab a series of beams that are connected. So since I was on this beam, it grabbed the other two beams connected to it, but it did miss that one. So I'm going to need to add this beam to it. So I'm going to go switch those from my reference beam yet again, because I'm a slacker. Then I'm also going to take those columns, because I wasn't really paying attention to what I did with columns, and I'm going to take them down to level 1 and put a 0 at level 2. Okay? So... When we start looking at this and getting inside of here, I was always frustrated that AutoCAD architecture, if I came into the column and moved the structural column up two feet, AutoCAD architecture, the beams would automatically move. And I'm like, man, that's just, I can't believe Revit structure doesn't do that. And then in 2012, I selected a beam, and I saw these different properties down here. This property down here is start connection and end connection. Now, obviously, with the beams, there's a start side and an inside. So if I delete that structural column over there, I'm only going to get my, sorry, that was the wrong property, not the start connection and connection, the end attachment or start attachment. This property just came out in 12, and I was like, what, what does this do? And I'm clicking in here, and it's like, okay, there's end elevation and distance. Great, distance. What, what, what happens here? And what you'll notice is when I change it to distance, what that's basically doing is associating itself to that column. So if that column now moves up and down, this beam is going to move up and down with it. And the reason they call it distance 
is because in the properties, it adds these other two options. It's the distance from either the top or the bottom of that structural column. So when I change it from top to bottom, you can see it then changes this end attachment um, value. So it's called my end attachment distance. So if I go from the bottom, it's 12 feet. If I go from the top, it's at zero. But what it also allows you to do is say, gee, you know what? I want it to be attached to it, but maybe I've got some K-series joists on there, so I need this one to be down two and a half inches. So I can come over here and grab this one, and that's going to be my start offset. So I'm going to come here and do my start attachment, say it's going to be distance, and I'm going to change the value from two to zero, because right now it's not the same, and boom, there we go. So we can now start getting these to come through and understand that, wow, these are going to be sitting K-series joists, and this one right here is going to be, you know, the metal deck sitting right on top of it. So this was a great tool when I saw this come out, because, like, man, now I can just start playing with the heights of all my columns, and as my design changes, I don't have to go back and grab every single one of those beams. All right, in the past it was me, I was coming in here, grabbing the column, saying, okay, gee, the column goes up two feet, then I'm going to use my tab key to grab these two beams. I don't know why I'm not seeing the end number up here. Weird. Okay, now I have it. So I'm going to go in here and then make that go two feet. Then I had a rules if it went down, right? So over here in this corner, I was going to go down a foot. Well, I don't move the column first. I move the two beams down first, and then I'd go grab the column and move the column's properties down. Well, by changing those all to be your end attachments or start attachments, you now can just associate those to the columns. So that to me was, was a big deal when I saw it. And I've actually used it on a lot of projects to do some other things where I have to have this object move up and down with the other object. Okay, so this next feature I'm going to show you. So far, everything I've showed you has been there at least since 12. Uh, most of those other things have been there for a very long time. But if you are using Revit 2013 or 2012, this concrete join is not going to be there. This concrete join tool is the uh, was new in 2014. So I'm going to come in here and we're going to go. Let's go level one, and we'll just go ahead and model a concrete column this time. So I don't know if anybody's had a concrete column and they get really frustrated with the concrete columns. And we'll model another one here, and we'll go ahead and put a structural concrete wall in. Do -do -do -do. I should have just probably drawn a rectangle. It would have made my life easier, but that's okay. We'll just come in here real quick. Anybody else add sound effects in their drawing? Oh, I'm all about the sound effects. So I'm going to grab these walls, and I'm going to make them go 10 feet below level 1 up to level 2. That's great, right? So we've got the connections in here. So I'm going to go ahead and do a slab or a floor. I'm going to go ahead and do a concrete floor. And I'm going to go ahead and pick my walls making sure it's on level one, and finish my concrete floor out. So one thing that has always irritated me about Revit, and I'm going to get out of the realistic and just go to consistent colors. Oh, man, analytical model's on. That's not analytical. There we go. So one thing that's always irritated me is if I come in here and just start looking at oh, stupid structural columns, take the structural column and make it go up to level two and go like three feet below. There we go. So one thing that has always irritated me on this information is you'll notice that when I hover over this column, the floor is joined to it and it's cutting it out, right? So if I come here and we'll start looking at this column, it's like, oh wow, well the wall cut the column, and then if I hide the floor, the floor cut the column, and there wasn't really anything you could do about it in, in previous releases. So what's really nice about 2012, and again, I'm just going to hide this wall, or 2014, excuse me, is the fact that new to the join command is a switch join order. So if you ever just hit the join command, you're never really hitting the drop down. There's a now a switch join order. And I always tell people pay attention to your um, status bar at the bottom left corner because it's telling me first pick the element to which join another join element is joined. So I want to take this one and make it run through that. Oh wait, I didn't do anything. Yes, I did. Look, now the floor is being notched. So now if I come in here and hide the floor, you're going to see the column is going straight through. So same thing can happen with concrete um, columns to walls. If I go grab my join tool and I'm going to say switch the join order, I want to switch the join order of this to this, and I believe now the wall is being notched. So again, hide the structural column, and you can see the wall now is notched, 
as well as the floor is being notched. This was huge for me for the structural columns because who's ever done a graphic column schedule on concrete columns and they're only like half the size they should be. They've got all these cutouts in them and yeah, totally, totally not even worth it to do a graphic um, column schedule for concrete columns because it never worked. Now we can actually do this join order tool and get these to show up. This to me was, was huge. This was just really big for me. It was graphic column schedules work now. I can get it to look correct in the floor plans, you know, and that doesn't change, you know, that now is changing slightly, let's go back to that line, you know, it's kind of changing that, hey, this is thin because this is connected, so you see it a little bit, but it's, it's totally worth, this is the object running through, this is what's happening, and, and all of those tools are going to be inside of there. So yeah, to me, this, this was a big feature when I saw this come out. Now, what it doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to play with concrete wall joints. Eh, that's got to call them up. We'll do these ones. So let's say all of a sudden we wanted to do this, and you want to start showing maybe this one not running through or this one running through. The join tool does not change the join order from one wall to the other. So notice how it's not even letting me pick this wall because that wall is not joined to a column or anything else, a beam or anything concrete. So it's not going to change concrete wall joins. It only changes concrete columns to concrete walls, floors to concrete, so that's what it'll change. It will not change the joins, auto joins that are built into some of the other aspects of the program. So, but that to me, that was kind of a big one too and what I like to do. Okay, so my next slide. So somebody had actually posted up on the LinkedIn Revit Structure um, group that they would love to see tilt up slash precast construction. So how do you do precast construction? How are you doing tilt up in relationship to walls? So it'll actually work for columns too if you wanted to do this next feature I'm going to show you. So one thing that I always like to have inside of here, I'm going to undo the unsquareness because it's going to drag me crazy. And let's go make this like a 72 foot wall. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to model this out, and what I want to do now is start showing, hey, this is tilt up. So all these walls are going to be tilt up, or possibly these walls are going to be um, Precasts. So I'm not going to, I don't want to model 30 little walls. So if one wall moves, we got to remember to move the other walls. Or when the design changes and I've got to go from 8 inch concrete to 10 inch concrete, I don't want to have to remember to grab 10 different walls or whatever it may be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use grids. Or excuse me, not grids. I'm going to go ahead and use what are called parts. And I'm going to throw a couple grids on here so I can show you two ways to do this. So what you can do is you can start grabbing your walls. And I'm just going to do it on these. This, to two walls here, but you could do it on 50 walls if you wanted to. And we're going to say we're going to go generate parts from these walls. Okay? So what happens when you generate parts is inside of Revit, it's now doing two things. You can see my line weights look different. So this is still a wall. I didn't part this. This is now going to be a part. So what happens when you generate parts is it creates an identical instance of a layered object. So walls, floors, roofs, ceilings, as well as structural foundations and I think soffits and a couple other things now. So what it does we can generate this as a part. Now what happens is the original wall is still there. We basically have done a copy of that wall on top of itself. And if you do it with a layered wall, it's going to generate parts for every single one of those layers. So if you had a brick on CMU wall, I probably should have made that wall architectural. Let's just undo and do it again. So if we have a brick on CMU wall, and we go part out this wall, you're going to see it's going to boom. All of a sudden, now I've got a CMU layer, a brick layer, an air gap layer, a stud layer, whatever else that was in the design of this wall. So parts take layered elements and, and generate a part out of every single layer in there. If it's something like concrete, you get a single element. And what it does is the original wall still exists. So in this view, you can see it says parts visibility is show parts. But if I go into a 3D view, Right now, I'm not seeing any parts, anything looking differently inside of here. It all still looks like the same object because this view has the parts not being showed but displaying the original object. So if I come over here and switch this to show parts, you're now going to see that, oh, there's the layered object and all of its parts. And here's my two walls not joining because those have been parted out. So how we can take advantage of this is now I can come back to this wall that's been parted and I can select it and I can choose to divide that the parted segment. So I've got the original wall, I'm not messing with that, I'm taking this part. So I can choose to add parts to parts, I can choose to edit the sketch. In this case, I'm going to come over here and edit the sketch, and I'm going to put a part right here, and I'm going to divide the part at another 15 foot increment. 
and do one here. You're also noticing that as I'm sketching this, I'm not sketching right on top of the wall, but I'm going to the extents of the dashed lines. This actually becomes critical because if I was just drawn to the edge of the wall and the wall got from an 8-inch thick to a 24-inch thick wall, then it's not going to understand I'm dividing all the way through the wall and it's probably going to give you an error warning. So I'm going to take those two parts and I'm going to just finish my sketch. So now I've got a part over here and I've got a part over here. But you're not forced to do it by sketches. You can also grab intersecting references. You can grab intersecting references of levels, grids, or planes, so any datum element. So I'm going to come down here and say I want to do grids, and I want to do grid 1 and 2, and say OK. And so this has been divided by the two sketches I put in, and it's also been divided by the grid lines. Now what's also cool about parts when you divide them is you can give them a gap. Gee, I wanted a 1 inch gap. So now it's not just divided, it's not just split apart. There's my 1 inch control gap, gap for my precast or my tilt up construction. So boom, it's inside of there. You can also choose to use division profiles if you wanted to. So I want to come in here and do maybe a stepped angle division profile. So you're really in precast, and these are going to be leaning up against each other before the embeds or whatever. You can come in here and say that's going to be complementary or mirrored. I don't know why you would part it out and have a gap, but maybe it is parted, and this is part of your reveal system when you get into there. I'm not sure. So a lot of different options they have inside of here, and this is just out of the box. You can do notches. Maybe there's a steel support in there or whatever you can come in here and set this up. You can also flip the profiles. Of course, it's symmetrical, so it's not doing anything. And you can play with the profiles and offset them even more to give them a larger gap if you needed to. So a lot of different things that you can do inside of this if you really wanted to. And I'm just going to go back to none and finish that division. So now you can see here's my wall one, here's my wall two. Oh, wait, no, let me phrase that. Here's my part one, here's my part two, here's my part three. So as you start going around, it's the parts. And yes, that's not a, well, it's kind of a view-specific thing, but you are editing the model. Just drew this right through the middle of the steel. Beautiful design. But you are editing the model, but the original wall still exists. So if I come in here and say show original, there's my original wall. So if I wanted to take that original wall and switch it from 10 inches to 8 inches, the wall's changed. And then if I go back and look at my parts, guess what's going to happen? My parts have updated to be 8 inches thick as well. So I control the original assembled object or layered object to get my parts, etc., to do what they need to do. Then these parts go a lot farther, too. You can grab the parts, and you can then start excluding parts from things. Or if I wanted to, I could grab two parts and merge those two parts together. So now this is looking like one giant precast impossible to, to, to transfer transport panel. But now I've got this large panel. So I can start going in and dividing parts and merging parts and going through and doing what I wanted to do. And the other part that's really cool about these is if I go back to say show the original, I'm going to go ahead and put an opening in here. I'm going to just go ahead and do my window opening, and we'll put the window there. So right, I've just put a window in this, this wall, right? You can see through it, there's my nice window. If I go back and say show the parts, the parts picked up on the fact that I put a window. Look at that perfect placement I did right through the middle of that, that division. So it's still going to update and understand what's going on in there. One of the beautiful tools that we have, um, let me close some of windows, let me go back into this file. So in this file, eh, oops, I've already done it. Um, I hate it when I do accidentally hit save after a presentation. Yeah, those parts shouldn't be there, so let me just come in here and filter out the parts. Let me delete this out. So one thing that's also cool about the parts is what I can do is I can part through a linked file. So if I come over here to one of my 3D views that has, oh, it is this view, so I must have, I it turned off. Yes, I turned it off. So here's my architect's model turned back on. Well, I can take that architect's model, and I'm going to have to tab to find his wall. So once I've got the architect's wall selected, I can generate parts through the link. So if I go back to my visibility graphics now and just turn off the architect's file, I've generated parts from what they had in the architect's model. So if I needed to only show studs, or if they had a concrete wall, I can just get the parts inside of there. So then I could do one of two things. I could tab and grab this part here and exclude it. It's basically like, kind of like deleting it, or more like removing the element from a group. So I'm just going to go through and exclude all of the gypsum board, and now I'm left with only the, in this case, I believe, metal stud core part left. So it's one of these great tools. Oh, looks like I forgot to exclude that other part on the inside, but you get the point. 
So now I've got this part, it's the metal stud six inch core. So using those parts to go through and start you know, breaking it down, and you can part out structural columns. So if you want to model one column going up the 200 story building, because it's all that, and then just part it out to break it down to start showing the parts independently. So parts are a really, really beneficial tool um, for what we start getting into in that. Okay, and this is one that I've always struggled with. So you've got this nice curve or undulating roof, and we really need to get a beam that's going to um, go through and get that match what's going on. I actually picked this up at RTC this year, so this is a new one to me. I had another way to do this which worked, but oh my god, my way was tedious. So during my presentation, somebody actually spoke up and talked about this, and I, this was the best tip I took from RTC this year. So I'm going to jump back into Revit. All right, we'll just go back to the sample file. Is this my sample file? Yeah. So um, let's go create a roof by extrusion. So I'm going to go create a roof by extrusion. This would be something the architect had done, right? So roof by extrusion. I'm going to have to go pick a plane to put it on. We'll just pick the face of this wall. Sure. So you might have a curved roof. You might have, and I'm, if you, for the 13% of you that are architects out there, don't ever do a spline roof, but I'm going to. So, right, I've got this beautiful roof here like this. Has anybody here ever wanted to create a beam? That would work with this, right? So there's my roof. And I've got to get a beam to go to the underneath side of that roof. Yeah, I don't know if you guys ever did this and how you did this, but it's not fun trying to do this. So... What's beautiful about this tip that came up is I'm going to go to floor plan. The guy who told me about this is he goes in and he draws a truss. So I'm going to go draw a truss. I'm going to draw a very long truss underneath this roof. And I'm going to go back to 3D. All right, so there is somewhere a truss. There's my truss. Oh, my trust is probably using my reference beam family. Ah, nice. So I'm going to come in here and set a framing type. And the only thing I'm going to do for this is set a framing type for the top cord. All right, so my framing top for the top cord, I'm just going to use an 8 by 10 And then in here, I'm going to say, yeah, there's a way to say none in here. So I'm going to say okay to this. And I'm going to show you how to fix this in a second. So okay, I'm just going to set a framing type for my top cord. So now I've got a top cord on this. I'm also going to come down here and tell Revit that I don't want to create a bottom cord. And then I'm going to go edit this family and break it in a second. But what's beautiful about a truss is a truss can be attached to a roof just like a wall. I'm going to take this truss, attach it to my roof. The truss picks up, oh, sweet, fatal error. Okay, maybe this spline was too much. <laughs> Could be this part of the spline over here is a little bit tight. So let me just go edit this profile. See, you can always tell I'm doing it live and in person. Make it a little less crazy. Okay, I did this at RTC. It worked beautifully. Um, we're going to go attach it to this. Try it again. I missed the roof. It's going to think about that. It's going to take it a minute. So what I've done to get this to work is I've generated a trust family. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to have to do a little bit less crazy of a roof. Let's go edit the profile. We'll delete it. We'll just do an arc. I was trying to go crazy, and I should have just done something simple. Let's make sure. Eh, that's not the button I wanted. And we'll just take this arc out. It could be the problem. It probably could have been actually that my truss is wider than this roof. Let's see. Okay, so now we're going to take this truss, and hopefully we won't get a fatal error this time, and we'll attach it to this roof. No? Hmm, okay, so we're going to have to edit the truss. So what I've done, just to show you guys this, is I've actually edited the truss family. And in the truss family, what I've basically done is deleted all of the webs. So I have a top cord and a bottom cord truss. So there's no webs in this. I think that's project three we're doing this in. I'm going to overwrite the existing version. So I took one of the trusses they had. You can see now that there's no webs in this truss. And hopefully the fifth time should be the charm, right? Definition of insanity. It's not. It's not charming. Right, it cannot attach to the truss. I have a truss cannot project to a surface or attachment created 
creates an invalid profile. Why is that creating an invalid profile? The profile should be fine. I tried doing it this way, but the problem with this way is it doesn't update. Now we'll see, can I attach? Yes, I know, to this. Okay, so hopefully that works. So what you do is you go in and you can go ahead and attach. I believe we've got it through the, uh, let me undo. So I'll show you what I did because I just kind of did it without explaining, sorry. So I'm taking this trust and I'm just going to try something here. I'm just going to edit the profile and I'm going to delete the top cord that's there. I'm going to try just creating a very simple top cord that doesn't follow what the roof is doing. Oh, see, my trust is larger. That's what my problem is. I thought I modeled that narrower than my roof. Cancel, yes. Make the truss shorter. Oh, you're not going to let me make the truss shorter in an elevation view? There. So now my truss is shorter. It's Twelve times the charm. There we go. So what I've done is I've taken that truss and I've attached that truss to the roof. The truss does have to be shorter than your roof, which I thought I had both times, but obviously not. So now the beauty of this, this truss is attached to the roof. So if I come in here and I edit the profile of the roof, and I just come in here and change this, no, that's not the button I wanted, uh, uncheck, keep concentric, then grab that grip. So if I the proof, profile of that roof changes, that beam is updating with it. Now I know a lot of people say, oh, well, you could just go do a beam, choose a grid, and then pick the underneath side of the roof, which works, but it doesn't update all of the time. So once you go through and set this up, it's not going to update, it's not going to update. The other part that's cool about this, I'm going to do this from a floor plan so I don't screw it up too terribly bad, is I can now copy this up. Say it's a residential roof, so I'm just going to copy it up to a few times at two feet. Those ones are all still attached. So I can do one, attach it, boom, all the other ones are still attached. So I've now got this truss, which is just my top cord, my joist, whatever you want it to be, and I can copy it over as long as it's underneath that roof as many times as I want, and it's fixed. It's done. That before, I had a crazy where I had to go put a void in the family and then pick the edge and put a void and pick the edge. And I kept moving my void every two feet and then picking the edge. And then the architect would change their mind on the roof and I'd have to go delete them all and basically start over again. This way, no matter what happens to the roof, all of those update. It's just, I don't know, to me it's, it's a crazy amazing tool for this to happen. So that to me was a really big tool I took out of the RTC conference when we got into it. Brian, there's a... There's a question from our friend in the springs, Brian, as well. And he, he liked the, the parts. He says that parts was nice. Can I change the uh, column size as it goes up using parts? So, when I, so I'm going to take this column here and make a part. And I'm going to go ahead and divide the part. And I'm going to use my intersect. I'm going to use level 1 because I think that's the only intersect level it's hitting. And nothing will be divided because I'm right at level one. Let me go back and get the column now. So let me say show original. Let me get this column and it's three feet below level one. What if I work? Oh, I'm also going to go ten feet above level two and we'll divide the part at level two. So we got this set up right, so it is above level two. We should have been paying attention. So I'm gonna come grab the parts now. So what you'll get is and divide this part and go to my intersecting reference and grab level one two. Okay, so now what you see on this is this part is here. So I can kind of, I can't necessarily change it, but I can get shape handles because a part is not a column. So then I can play with the size by pulling in the shape handles. So you can do the same thing with the other thing. So I'm not necessarily changing the column size as it goes up, but I can play with the shape handles and start giving, you know, I can actually use the numbers, but I can play with the, the shape handle to change the size as it's going in. So if I was changing the sizes, I don't know if I'd necessarily do it on a column-wise, especially not if it's steel or anything like that. But for the concrete, possibly. I have seen people use this where they'll come in to, like, the different walls, and they'll say, you know, let me go show the shape handles, and then, you know, this concrete wall bumps out, that concrete wall goes in, show the shape handles on this one, this one bumps out. And it does work pretty nice to be able to go through and start, you know, having different thicknesses of walls, etc but not necessarily getting into the column size changing. I've also done this with a client where we modeled a wall, the wall was precast, and then we parted out the precast. Um, they were just surface precast, not structural precast. So they were just the, the decorative precast panels. We just did a wall with the patch patterns in the wall. We divided that 
individual wall, which they've modeled in front of the structural wall, into parts. And then we just started doing the shape handles to change all the ins and outs and do what we wanted to do. Because that was much easier than trying to come up with some sort of crazy family scenario of what was happening. So it worked really well for that. But I don't know if I'd use it for changing column sizes in the weapon now. I think the first thing I'd do is get that metal thing out of the middle of that. Looks, looks like a train wreck a little bit. <laughs> fine, I'll get rid of my train wreck. I like train wrecks. They're fun. Okay. The other thing, too, and I didn't really do it here in Apple Roof, is you can also part out your floors. So if you want to start talking about, okay, gee, here's, here's um, a floor. I want to kind of break it up with control joints. If you're calling out the control joints again, I would part the floor. And then once that part's there, I could divide it. And then I can divide it. You know, I'm just going to use my two grid lines that are there. But I could go through and divide it by the grids or draw reference lines or just sketch where I wanted it to be divided. And now I can kind of look, hey, I've got this divided floor as well as this. And you can divide the structural wall foundations. There's a lot you can start doing with it. The other downside I think I did forget to mention is parts are parts. And what I mean by that is there's no difference between a wall part, a floor part, a ceiling part, a column part. If I go into visibility graphics and say, hey, I don't want to see parts, and I turn parts off, then all parts go away and it shows me the original wall. I can't, through visibility graphics or even line weights, change the different looks. And that's the other big one. If I go back to level one, you're going to see that now my parted column has the exact same line weight as my parted wall as my parted everything else. All of the parts are going to have the exact same line weights. So that is kind of one thing that starts happening when you go through and get it set up is the parts are parts. Now, one great tip on that is you can, um, that's not what I wanted, you can go create a filter. So I can go create a filter for my parts, and one of the categories you can do is original type or original family. So I can say, what was the original family, what was the original type, and you can say, hey, I'm looking for wall parts. So for whatever reason, I wanted to create this, this filter and filter out only my wall parts and leave on something else, or maybe I want to take the wall parts and override the cut lines, right? So I can come through here and override the cut lines on just the wall parts. You're able to go through and set that up. So it would take a little bit if you were going to do an entire project in parts and you wanted to play with line weights, etc. It's going to be a lot of filters set up. Obviously, you'd be playing those with view template and then setting up line weights, turning things on and off, etc. So good question. I kind of diverted a lot farther from that, but yes. Yes, but he thanked us profusely, so we're good. So the other one that I've been playing with, and actually I meant to do a poll on this one. I'll also have you guys raise your hands since I forgot to do an official poll. Has anybody been using adaptive components yet? I mean, I know all the time that I see adaptive. Raise your hand if you've been using adaptive components. You know, I see all these presentations on adaptive components, and it's like, oh, gee, look, you can go do this crazy, weird structure, and you can do crazy panels, et cetera, et cetera. And the one thing that I've been playing with are, and toying with are adaptive um, panels, adaptive component families. And I've got a couple for structural purposes here that I wanted to show, and it doesn't look like anybody's using them. Everybody's so, just staring at us, Brian. They're just staring. <laughs> so this is one that I just, I was trying to come up with an idea. I'm doing a presentation at Central States Workshop next week, and I wanted to, to come up with an adaptive point for structural engineers and, and some other things. And so I came in, quickly did this eight-point adaptive component. And I just, you know, gave it a terrible name of structural connection because that's so descriptive. But what I've done with this is I've now created this eight-point adaptive component where what an adaptive component is, it's going to give you points that you can select. And those points then get hosted to the object they're on, and they adapt with the host object. So I'm just going to come in here, and I've created this eight-point adaptive family. But now I can just click on those beams. And boom, here's a plate. I know this isn't a technical plate, but like I said, it took me two minutes to create this. So now I've got this nice little plate-looking family that's on here, and it took me eight points to do. And like I was saying, what's beautiful about this is if I come in here and grab these objects and the design changes and those beams need to move up, this adaptive component family is just going to adjust with the host object. So as the angle changes, as this comes through and goes done, boom, here's my plate. The beauty part is I can then take that plate and give you angles and dimensions and really start coming through here and saying, oh, okay, here's exactly what it is. And if I wanted to, I could even unfold that so I could then show how it would be bent to a fabricator, but I didn't get into that with this one. So but what's nice about that is that, that plate's so flexible, right? It's just an eight-point component, 
But even if I wanted to, I could then come over here and place it maybe on the top. Maybe you wanted this one to be on the top. So it's going to be my eight-point component. I might have had to go to the inside first, so I might have screwed this up. We will find out shortly. Ooh, beautiful. Oops. So I'm going to take this point. So if you did miss it, like I did, you can rehost a point. Rehost a point. I guess I really wasn't paying attention. Oops, that's not where I wanted to go. Take the host. Just needed to be up here somewhere. Okay, so kind of not exactly maybe what you were thinking of. Maybe I needed to point out there. But what you kind of see is taking this one adaptive component family and using it in many, many different scenarios. And like I said, everything on that is going to update as you start going through and setting it up. So again, it's just you pick eight points on hosts. Preferably those hosts to be somewhat in the same work plane. And boom, you can start coming through and setting these same adaptive component family up to create all of these plates. So kind of an example on this. Now, I know we need to be a little bit more accurate. I've just been throwing these down. What's beautiful about adaptive components is you can also use the tab key to get to that adaptive point once you've placed it. And what's great about adaptive points is they have rules. So what are they doing on their host? So one of them is they call it a normalized curve parameter, which is basically a percentage of the host. Or you can come in and say segment length. So I need that to be two feet away. So I've now just moved that one adaptive point two feet away. I can come up to this one and give it a segment length. And I can choose the beginning or the end and make it two feet away. So now, no matter how long this beam gets, no matter how it changes, I'm always exactly two feet away. So this is one of those things that I'm just kind of opening this up for you to start seeing what, what the capability of this is, what's going to start happening inside of there to really get this object to understand, hey, here's how we're set up and here's how we're going through. You know, Brian, it, just a kind of an interesting side note, or it's interesting to me anyway, because I watched it go on for months. Um, up in Longmont, there's, I, I'm, as you know, I'm a big swimmer, and it doesn't really matter, but just that the city of Longmont was constructing some new bath houses at one of their outdoor pools in the past couple years, and they made these kind of tiki hut-looking things with roof beams just like that. And that project ran way over in cost, and they had people sitting up there on the roof trying to cope those beams for literally months. <laughs> and had they been using this, they would have been done in no time. <laughs> somebody said, um, somebody needs to show this to Simpson and get Simpson's strong tie to start creating yeah. some really cool families. Yeah. So the last one I'm going to show you on this, because I only have eight minutes left, and I have, you guys have been asking questions and comments as we're going through. But this is one that I've created, and this is an eight-point family, or nine-point family, so it's a slightly different family. And it's got this random point floating off here to the side. So what this one was, same thing, I went through and picked my points, and I adjusted the, the um, placement on those. But what you'll see in this family when I hover over is there's that crazy point floating way off over here in space. Well, this point is what's also called a shape handle point. And what's cool about the shape handle point is you can pick a host for that after it's been placed. I'm going to pick the other side of this. And notice how my bracket thickness is changing depending on where that shape handle point goes. I grab that shape handle point again, and I don't know, I'll say pick a new host, and I'll pick over here on this wall. Look how deep that bracket is becoming. So what you do with that shape handle point, come on, get the shape handle point right there, is you pick it on the host of your object. And what's beautiful about putting it on the host of my object is now when it's on the host of that face, if that member size changes, this bracket automatically goes up with it. So I don't have to go change it out to be a 10-inch bracket, a 12-inch bracket, a 14-inch bracket. I don't have to change it as the ridge slope changes or any of that information goes through. I just have to change it for the bracket. Now, I will tell you that I'm going to have an issue here because with the way this is done, I've got to rethink it. If I go change these to be a different size beam, they're changing from their center point, so they're getting fatter than this, and it might blow this bracket up. We'll see. So I've got a 10 by 12. We'll go change it to a 12 by 14. And yeah, it's freaking out on the bracket because now I've got this notch in here that it's not capable to do. So let's see if we go change this to be a, put a 12 by 12 in there? Do not. Let's go duplicate it. Yay, let's go create 12 by 12. Woo! Uh, how about a 12 by 12? <laughs> not a 12 by 12 foot. about the inch mark? 
Okay, so you can kind of see that sometimes, and this is something that I haven't found out what's going on with the adaptive components. If one of the hosts does something and it freaks out, it doesn't even tell you it's deleting it. It just disappears. So you have to be careful with that. And this is one I've got to figure out a different way to do it. Because you, or you have to change both of them at once, but being that one's a column and one's a, a beam, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. So just some points of that that you're going to have to look at doing. But how that one was, and I'll just do it over here to show you the placement on that one, is I've got this, you know, nine point, and I've got a flat version of it too. And again, it's the same thing, nine points. I remember my nine points now, so I think I go this way. So nine point family, I think I go one, two, three. I have to count, otherwise I lose track. It's just part of the sound effects, Brian. Yeah, it's my sound effects. Yep, I thought I missed that first point. But again, not a huge deal. Pick a new host, pick it on this work plane, and boom. So there's my T family. The nice part, again, on the T family, I could use the exact same family down here at the base. So hopefully that's something that you guys will see what's going on and really start to like what's going on with those adaptive points. I know there's tons of other tips that people may have and want to get in there, but that's really all I had for my hour time frame. Brian, if that isn't enough, these people are jaded and everything. So hopefully you guys learn something from it, and you can take something out of it and start playing with it back. And if you want, you can go ahead and email me or give me a post. Um, I do have a handout for this adaptive component stuff, because I'll be teaching at Central States Workshop next week, but I won't be giving it out until after next week, because... The people who are paying to go there should get that handout first. And I see a lot of familiar names on the uh, attendee list here today, but I see uh, several that I don't recognize. That doesn't mean you're not from our Colorado, Wyoming area, but uh, it, it uh, you may be outside of the area. And I just want you to know that BD Mackey Consulting um, and CAD1 partner together, but uh, Brian works all over the country and really could work all over the world. He's going to Europe next month to the Revit Technology Conference over there and uh, is a, a presenter at uh, AU this year along with uh, his wife and, and structural engineer Desi Mackey and the, the Revit team, the, the D in BD Mackey. So if you're looking at uh, contacting Brian, go to the uh, Revit Geek blog. You can read his blog and you can also find the uh, information about his company and how he can maybe work with you on in instructional needs and so forth. And then if you're uh, looking for um, information on Revit or BIM or any of the Autodesk products or classroom training here in the Denver and Colorado, Wyoming area, certainly feel free to contact CAD1 as well. So once again, thank you, Brian, for uh, another great presentation. Brian will be back next uh, month on September 12th. We have another version of Revit Radio and then usually have a follow-up webinar after I that. So it's going to be detailing. So okay. I'll get back into the detailing part one, two, three. And I actually do have something new to add to it a little cool. bit this year. So The detailing is pretty popular, and we'll try and actually get it recorded right this time. So anyway, thanks very much for joining us. Are there any questions? Uh, no, just a whole lot of thanks. This was great. Good. Well, we appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, if they're important to you, tell your friends. And if they're not, don't tell anybody. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.